Hello again, Chris Lee and Luke Wyatt. We are the Vandy Sports Podcast, part of the 440 Sports Network. Billy Derrick usually joins us on Wednesdays, but couldn't make it today, so it's just Luke and I. A reminder, this show is presented by our friends at Anchor Impact. Commodore Nation, get closer to Vanderbilt Athletics than ever before. With Anchor Impact, the official NIL collective, for Vanderbilt University, gain access to unmatched exclusive coverage. Be a part of a one-of-a-kind community. As an Anchor Impact member, you will gain exclusive privileges and benefits, offering deeper engagement with student-athletes, coaches, staff, and the entire Vanderbilt community. Access behind-the-scenes content with exclusive events, merchandise, and personalized experiences, creating an unparalleled connection with the student-athlete's journey. You can also become a catalyst for change. Redefining the landscape of college athletics and showcasing the potential impact of NIL on student athletes' lives. Join the mission of Anchor Impact to support student athletes and evaluate, or excuse me, elevate Vanderbilt athletics to new heights. Become a member today. Be part of this impactful journey. Help the Commodores thrive and contribute now by logging on to anchorimpact.com forward slash register. By the way, we've got an interview that we'll be doing with Nate Johnson tonight, one of the two transfer quarterbacks of Vanderbilt Scott. So I'm looking forward to that. I've never never been around Nate, spent time with him. I know he was a very highly regarded kid out of high school and can fly. So, boy, there's a lot of a lot of places we go with that conversation that we'll have. Uh, so you'll be able to see that soon. The show also presented um, by our friends at the Murfreesboro Pure Milk Studio. Or excuse me. <laughs> Nervous Pearl Pure Milk Company. We're off to a rousing start here today. A third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro, a partnership that began 50 years ago with Purity Dairy and Nashville provide purity milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. They now serve Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, and North Georgia. Today, they supply grocery stores, convenience stores, other places with purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, haagen ice cream. For more information, visit their website at npmci.com. They sponsor baseball season. we got a baseball podcast coming up. I think that's going to air Friday. Luke and I will get into baseball a little bit today, though. And in the meantime, basketball season presented by friends at the Watch House. By the way, Purity Dairy, as I always say, their, their homemade vanilla is tremendous. So my favorite flavor. Moose tracks, all kinds of things there. Uh, support the people who support our show. Our news presented by the Wash House as though it's basketball season. Are you dreading laundry days? It's stealing time to take care of the things you truly enjoy. Let the laundry professionals at the Wash House take care of that for you with two convenient locations in the greater Nashville area. Just drop off your dirty laundry. Our professional attendants can get you back the one thing you can never have enough of. That's your time. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh, clean laundry. Ready to be put away. Check them out at washhouseclean.com. Stop in today. Get your time back. All right, Luke Wyatt, uh, baseball season is upon us. We are, what, nine days out. Again, we've got some content. We've got about an hour-long season preview. You'll have some thoughts. Uh, but but first, since we last talked, Vanderbilt has won a basketball game, won a basketball game against Missouri. Lost a basketball game against Kentucky last night. I think you were in the gym for both of them. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today, and I'll just let you go with that wherever you please. Good morning, Chris. Uh, yeah, I was at, I was there for both of them. Uh, we uh, we were at the point now, after, even after the win, I, I knew we were playing Kentucky at a bad time, first of all. Let's say that. But uh, I noticed at the beginning of the Missouri game, even though we won that game, the kids had to be poked and prodded to get going. I think we fell behind like 21 to nine and they weren't getting back on defense. Uh, then the sh a few shots started falling. So he started playing better and they wound up winning that game. And uh, I was happy for the kids last night, same thing, but you start off the way you did against a team like Kentucky. There's no recovering from that. Uh, we weren't getting back on defense. We were allowing wide open threes. We weren't making many ourselves. We shot a couple of air balls early until we got going. Uh, it's just, you know, I, and, and Chris, we beat it to death. It's the same old story. Uh, a change is going to have to be made. Uh, and uh, there's not a whole lot else you can say about this. We've just got another 
10 games to go. I, I, I think I'm correct in saying this. I did some research last week. Uh, in Southeastern Conference games, Jerry Stackhouse is the losingest coach in Vanderbilt history in modern day. He's winning 30% of his Southeastern Conference games historically in his five years. So uh, it's time to move on. Yeah, I've, I've I've got nothing to add except I hate to see things yeah. fall to the level they have. I hate it for the players, um, for, for the fans. Yeah. I mean, we're just yeah. – we're just at the point there's nothing else to say. So with that, you just want to talk baseball for a minute before we do the mailbag? That would be great. Yeah, I, I actually did some uh, homework, and uh, someone had posted a question, I guess, last week or maybe a couple of days ago about what we thought might be the starting lineup and depth. So I, I kind of went through and did a all where all 46 guys would land on the opening weekend. Do mm. I think the way it's going to be all year long? No. I think by the time the Southeastern Conference, after those first 17 or 18 games, by the time we get into the SEC, there'll be a ton of changes. And then, of course, you unfortunately may have an injury or two. But uh, I just kind of made out a lineup where I thought the guys, that, the 35 that you're allowed to dress uh, and travel, and then the guys that are on the outside looking in that will probably red shirt. And then there's three guys right now I think are out for the year with injuries, Chris. And you may correct me on any of this stuff because you're a lot smarter than I am. But uh, whenever you want to do it, I can just kind of quickly run through mine, and then you can take it from there. Well, I've got a, I've got a roster in front of me, um, and a list of things, and and I think, um, well, I don't know if you got yours pretty well organized. I'm fine with letting you. I, we could do either way. I can either read you what I got in front of me in the hierarchy, or you can just go with it how you please. But it'd probably be better because you know more than I do. But I do. I did want to kind of give my two cents of what I think it's going to look like. The couple of question yeah. marks, and who's who's out now. I have. First well, off, hang on, hang on. Give me, give me the out, out with injury first. The three guys I have out with injury is Ethan Robinson, a pitcher, R.J. Hamilton, and Duke e- Ekstrom or Ekstrom. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. Yeah, is that what um, you? Have? Yeah, I knew I knew R.J. was was going to probably miss the year, and I think I'd heard that on Ethan Robinson too. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty good. So that's, they started at 46. I got to get down to 35. That gets them at 43 to start. 43. Here's who I have as the, as seven non-active guys who I think will start the season, not, not on the roster. Okay. Ka- Muto. I'm sorry. Ne- Kaito Muto. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have you got him on your roster? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, but, but there's also a little bit of a, Sure. We're, we're having a couple of tech issues this morning that are uncharacteristic. But anyway, go ahead. Okay. Nathan Teague, Alex Kranzler, Deegan Cordova, Jacob Schultz, Nick Copenhaver, and Brennan Sieber. I think those seven guys will not be on the 35. Okay. Okay. The bench, Luke Guff, Colton Reagan. This is the pitchers. I'm sorry. Luke Guff. Well, Re- Reagan is hurt, is he not? I don't think so. I thought that too, but then I've heard that he's fine, that he's ready oh. to roll. So okay. we, we on that when you uh, next time you talk to Corbs. But I okay. think he, Luke Guth, Colton Reagan, Miller Green, Sawyer Hawks, J.D. Thompson, Levi Huseman, Sam Laboki, Ryan Ginther, Ethan McIlvain, Grayson Carter, David Horn, Andrew Dukanich, Bryce Cunningham, Devin Futrell, and Carter Holton. That's the pitching staff. There's 15 of them. Yeah, that would be um, – I had everybody but Guth and, and – Reagan. Yeah, Reagan. Excuse me. I, I, I lost train of thought because um, I, I I thought he was going to – I thought it was just presumed he was going to be out. But admittedly, I have not done my diligence on that one. Um, I made an assumption where maybe I did. I, I'm going to have a conversation with somebody over there probably tomorrow. So I'm a little bit behind on my prep at this point with all the other things we, we've got going on here. But that's that's not I, – I'll be honest. I thought Teague, Kranzler, and Schultz would be more factors than they are. So that's a little bit surprising. Uh, maybe I'll get a little get a little different intel on that. So that that's where I'm 
um, th- those are some, there was a little bit there I wasn't expecting. So anyway. All right. Continuing on with the bench. This is the uh, guys that won't start, but are, will play. Matt Osenfort, Logan Poteet, yep. Braden Holcomb, Ray Velasquez, Matthew Polk, J.D. Rogers, Matt Wolf, Devin Kadali, Colin, Colin Barzi, and Cooper Holbrook. Now, I will say this. There's some guys. This is the best. This is the deepest Vanderbilt has had a bench that, in my memory, Chris. That's yeah. the, thing, the guy, names on that list that could start in other years. Okay. Um, the starters, and I have an either or at two positions. I have a lineup of this and the batting order. I know you're going to differ with me on, but I'm just kind of guessing at this at best. Center field leading off RJ Austin. Batting second okay. and third, Davis Diaz. Okay. Third and first base, Chris Maldonado. Okay. The cleanup hitter, the de- designated hitter, Troy Laneve. Batting okay. fifth, either or. Jack Bolger or Alan Espinal at catcher. Batting six at shortstop, Jonathan Vastine. Hang on two seconds. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Seventh at right field, Jacob Humphrey. Batting eighth in left field, Calvin Hewitt. And batting ninth at second base, either or, Camden Cozeal or Jaden Davis. And that's interesting. That's what I've got. So. You know, again, by the time the SEC rolls around, it could be a lot different, but I think that's the way we're going to start the year. You had Humphrey and Wright? I did. I don't know why. I just I just think his bat's got to be in the lineup. And, again, I may be wrong on that. You, you could see, you know, a Braden Holcomb play. Uh, some, some of those guys that I have on the bench, like I said, this is the deepest Vanderbilt team. You know, yeah. Chris, last year I did the same thing, not on the air, but I did it myself. And it was so easy to to name the starting lineup. Uh, yeah, it's difficult this year, and that's a good thing. And then you've got fifteen pitchers, and of those fifteen, I feel like twelve of them are are SEC caliber right away. No, th- this one's tough, and probably some of it. I just have not had the time of my life to to get over there the, the way that I used to. Right. Some of it's family. Some of it is the the increasing demands of the the SEC. YouTube channel that I run that's that's just <laughs> it takes a little more from me every day. I don't say that in a bad way, it just is. Sure. But I, I think even if I were, and I I've made a phone call and a text here and there, but I, I kind of feel that way anyway. Like you've got you know, Bray, Braden Holcomb sitting there, huge wild card, probably the biggest power guy on the team on a team that needs it, but I think it's this glut of players that you talk about. I mean, I, I think you got to feel great about that as a starting point because when injuries happen and they do, you got a staff that that firmly believes in playing a lot of guys a lot of places and have them flexible. I, I think they are potentially, you know, th- this team may start out six, seven, eight in the country wherever people are slotting them, but this might be one as they get off the finish line and other teams have other guys go down, they start to pull a little bit ahead just by everybody else's attrition and their depth. They may not play that way at all. Right. I mean, they're, like LSU, I was talking to Matt Moscone yesterday on our SEC channel and talking – I mean, LSU's got depth coming out of its ears too. So it's not like Vanderbilt's the only team in the country in that position, but I think it's it is an unusually good spot. And, and I agree with you. I feel like going into the season – this is one of the hardest teams to figure, but it's also one of the rosters that that has got about as much talent one to thirty five. It feels like as any I've covered. Now it's just it's just not as top heavy, and I think that's where we're all hedging our bets. Yeah, and I think in the past, you know, we've had that where we're not top heavy, but we didn't have options off the bench. Yeah, the fact that someone goes into a slump or is not producing the power you thought or whatever it may be, or defensively not doing a good job, you can now reach down to that bucket and pull up another great player. Yeah. I feel like something's going to happen. Somebody is going to I – mean, you've seen it happen at different points in the season. Like it's a Brian Reynolds right, early getting a job and not – allow, or Tony Kemp. Uh, Tony might have been a little further along going into the spring and just not giving it up. You know, that that could happen with the Leneve or somebody like that. Um 
you know, it could happen with the with the Braden Holcomb, or you could see the thing that this happened late in the season with him a few times, where like a Javier Vaz jumps up and hasn't been a factor much of the season, but they go to Omaha, they got a hole somewhere, you know, got a guy who comes and plugs in who wasn't a factor most of the season. I, I just don't have any idea what's going to happen, and to me, that's what is going to make this season a lot of fun. I think usually they go in the season having a really good idea, right. Um, and, and there aren't a lot of surprises. This one, I'm just going into it with my eyes wide open. Well, you know, I, you mentioned Troy Lene. That's kind of my pick. Uh, we talk about this all the time in college sports. It's better to be old. And yeah. having been around as long as Troy Lene, I think he's going to be able to relax and play. Yeah. He's got academics behind him, so there won't be any pressure there. Uh, I think he's going to have a great year. <sighs> Anything else on baseball? No, just excited to get out to the Hawk, and uh, I guess if we can figure a path to get in there, that's one thing we can talk about. I uh, I don't know, Chris, if you know, I always park in the uh, hospital parking lot. I don't know if you know where that is across from the practice. Mm-hmm. Yes. The walk to get to Memorial Gym now is literally about, if you just walk at a slow pace, it's about 15 minutes because you have to go now around the tennis courts and cut through the final tennis court to get into the gym, to get up a 25th Avenue. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know where they're going to put a temporary path up to get into the Hawkins field. I don't know. Do they, I'm trying to remember, is the sidewalk blocked off from the, 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 the garage that's caddy corner to the right field foul pole? Do they have that whole sidewalk and everything blocked off? The Not the sidewalk, but they have, like, you, you have to walk. Like from as far as baseball, there's now a fence up on uh, on the street. You can't even walk. Right. So yeah, no, the sidewalk's not blocked off. You have to go all the way up to that sidewalk though. If you're on the other end of the, like if you're down by uh, Vanderbilt Way, yeah, you have to go all the way up and around the tennis courts through the little, uh, uh, I guess it would be a uh, courtyard area for tennis. You have to walk all the way around that. There's no shortcuts. You have to it, so, you, but, so you would walk in and along the right field foul line from that yeah. end. Yes. Okay. That's only- so the, yeah, I mean the, the the right field parking garage there, that's where they have us as media. We park at the top of it and walk. So for me, it's no issue. I'm just I'm and I'm guessing that's what'll happen with fans too, is that they'll have them park in there. So that would be bad. Otherwise, you're walking around all the way around the gym. Um yeah, the 20- I guess through that. Yeah, to, to to get to that to get to the bullpen entrance on the on the Vanderbilt clubhouse side, right on the third base. Yeah, right. I I presume they'll they'll let us know and we'll pass that on. Um, let's. You just want to hit the mailbag? Sure, let's do point. that. Okay. Mailbag sponsored by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call, 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Podcasts also prevented by pre- – prevented. Wow. Presented by John Levin and the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group. They advise government contractors on all aspects of their needs with a proud focus on matching legal solutions to business needs. They got their own very own Chris Lee. Um. Fun fact, they're great at what they do, have a, a massive staff of folks who can help you. So we we thank both of those people and all our sponsors. Um, okay, let's just, let's just get this part over with. There is a, I think there are. Yeah, there, there's a lot of. Who's who's getting fired types of questions? I think I'm just going to lump these all into one as I'm going down and making sure there's not a nuance in this. And I, I'm going to, rather than answering them directly, I'm going to start with the, a couple of stories, and I know you'll be a good guy to maybe connect dots or disagree or agree on some and not all. Um, and, and I'll start at a point where people are probably going, why is he starting here? I was talking to someone about not, not too long ago, 
just rehashing 2018 because I think 2018-19 just set the stage for a lot of things that kind of explain why Vanderbilt is where it is and how it runs and stuff that I didn't understand at the time and kind of had to go through seeing it and trying to figure it out to get my head around it. And I just asked the question. I said, hey, what what happened with Boo Corrigan? They had him ready to go back into 2018, wanted to come here from Army. He's now at NC State, and it just fell apart. And the consistency I heard at the time and still hear it now is that Vanderbilt pulled the plug on the hire. There are various explanations out there for why. I, I don't know what to believe. I have some ideas, but they would just be informed opinions. That's neither here nor there. So I was talking to one of the people that really understands it. And I mean, understands how it works and why it works, not just looking at it and applying the filters that 99.9% of you out there listening would, would apply because that's very important. You can't look at it the way that you would look at it without knowing. And this person just, just kind of laughs and said, they, they were never hiring an athletic director. And, and my first response was, wait, what? And, and then my next response was in my head was, well, of course you, you dummy. And th- let me connect the dots to another thing. I'd been running the site for about, I don't even know if I'd been a year, not, certainly not two years when they did the athletics restructuring back when they eliminated the athletic department. And at the time, it was, you know, they did their PR, why this is good. It's a great thing for Vanderbilt Athletics. And the rest of the world was sitting there having its fun with this. And, and I think that's where that's where everything really started on a, on a course to where things are that I don't know that they're ever going to change in our lifetime. It, it, we'll, we'll see. But my understanding of it was that there, there really wasn't a need for Vanderbilt to do what it did at the time. But David Williams wanted control over that athletic department, and booting Todd Turner out was, was the way to get it. And they went into this whole thing where we don't have an athletic director, we don't have an athletic department. It's under the umbrella of the school. From that point on, the school has looked at whoever runs the athletic department as more a vice chancellor over athletics than it does an athletic director. And the the vice chancellor over athletics is really no different than everywhere else at the school. They expect a a, a VC to, to look, talk, share the school's values, just like everybody else would. Your pedigree is important where you got your degrees all kinds of other stuff we could go into that some of which I could name some of which I probably couldn't. If you think of it through that lens, that athletics is always going to be run by a vice chancellor for athletics, who again is expected to seamlessly mix in with the other vice chancellors on campus. Somebody's told me there are about 30 of them and not an athletic director. I think everything follows from there. Uh, I can shed some light on this. <clears throat> Let's go back to when uh, we had a full staff meeting when Todd Turner was fired. Gordon Gee and David Williams had a full staff meeting and that I was in with the rest of McGugan. And we were told to drink the Kool-Aid. That's what we were told mm-hmm. specifically by David Williams. He said, if you don't, then we're out. What we're doing now uh, and this is they, they gave the reasons, a couple of reasons, because we were able to do Q and A afterwards, and there was a couple of questions asked: Why? Why? What technically? I mean, why are we doing this? And uh, the answer was, by putting it under one umbrella with the university, it opens up budgets. It opens up yeah. areas we can pull money from. That if you were just athletic standing on your own, you wouldn't have that opportunity. So that was the first thing. Second thing is, and this is, and now I'm going to move forward to Steve Ertel, the messaging. Yeah. That, that started way before Steve Ertel or Ertel, correct me if I'm wrong on his name. That's when that really started was back then that, hey, we wanted the messaging to be 
completely from the university and athletics. Yep. Just to, okay, so it started back in 2000, whatever that was. So we moved forward to Steve Hartel, and then once they got rid of the quote media relations department, that's when it got worse. And when I say yeah. worse, I think there was actually some good ideas that Gordon Gee had. I really do. But when he left, it all went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. And I think that's where we're at now. And how to correct this, uh, it's up to Daniel Deermeyer. I don't know that anybody's got the guts to buck the system. I just don't. Yeah. Well, then we're going to continue in the major sports to struggle, except for uh, Tim Corbin, who we've so said thousands of times, has distanced himself from this model. Yeah. He's got they're, his they're going to – well, and I'll just say this. I, I'm, I'm, I've kind of resigned. I'm just going to – everybody knows – my thoughts on things I've, I've i've had concerns for years i was kind of the only guy out there articulating them long, long before what is now surfaced surfaced and, and i think people thought i was probably a little crazy at the time but let me here, here let me, they are yeah i want to second and i'm not patting you on the back at all but this is for the people out there listening when I retired from Vanderbilt, and I've said this, but it's been a while since I've said it. When I retired from Vanderbilt, I got out for one reason. I saw what was happening. That's it. That's all I can say. It's a very broad brush. But I saw what was happening. And I saw one person in the media that saw what was happening, and that was you. And if people don't believe that, well, I think now they do believe it. They, they probably roasted you, crucified you in every way. But now they have to look at themselves in the mirror and say, you know, Chris was right about 90% yeah. of this. And none of us are right about everything, including myself. No. But listen, I lived in the place for 40 years. It was my home for 40 years. I still dearly love those athletes. But whatever else is going on in that building, for the most part, it still hasn't been corrected. I had high, high hopes when Daniel Deermeyer came in. I still haven't given up on Daniel. But – uh, we'll see after this basketball season if anything's going to change. That will be a big, Chris. That will be a big, uh, a big deal. If Coach Stackhouse stays, and they don't fire him, then we'll know that nothing's changing. Yeah. Look, I, I didn't. Th there was a lot I didn't know. I, I just had a sense. I, I think people know. I, I worked in higher ed. I was a VP at a small school that eventually collapsed itself through some of the same things I've witnessed. Um, I, I'm not going to go to that. I used to sit in board meetings and, and kind of know uh, of some things that were being done, not on the up and up and the, and the bad actors and all those things. And I, I, I just have a, a very sixth sense when I, I size something up and it, it just doesn't look like it's set up to work. Um, I don't know. There's there's a lot more to say, but I think there's more to. I I don't know what's to, to be gained by saying it at this point, but I, I would just tell people, if you can make that switch in your mind, that the school wants athletics run by a vice chancellor who's going to see it like the other vice chancellors, and look at it like the other vice chancellors do, where winning is just kind of a, a line item on a list of things that are you know, that, that are, that matter, but you know, whether they matter more or less than other things, you know, you, you look, you look at be the judge. So I, I, I think any, any, any talk of hiring and firing and whatever, you can't really interpret it. I mean, it, it, it's like, Doing it at Vanderbilt is like using a map of New York City, um, you know, to, to try to get around in, in Lexington, Kentucky. It just doesn't translate, and and you have to you have to use their map to understand how they think and where they're going to go. Well, one, one other quick thing I want to talk about. Last week I got a little pushback on this, but I I mentioned that there were four or five thousand at the Missouri game four or 5,000 true Vanderbilt fans, and some people got irritated that I said true fans. Let me tell you why I say that. 
you can still go and support the kids. Okay. And, and you say, well, the, the only way we can show that we're disapproving of what's going on is by not going or selling our tickets to opposing fans. Well, first of all, I 100% disagree about selling your tickets to opposing fans. I, 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 there's no defense in that in my book. It's your money. You can do what you want to. But I'm just saying in my opinion. Second thing is, and we've said this before in here, Chris, they don't think like we do. Yeah. Just because we don't show up, that doesn't matter to them. It's obvious. Yeah. It doesn't matter if we got 4,000 there or one person there. That's not going to be what makes changes over there. What makes changes is Daniel Deermeyer and the Board of Trust. If they don't, it doesn't matter whether we have 10,000 Vanderbilt fans or one, one Vanderbilt fan in a ball game. Yeah. So that's the reason why I said the ones that go really are trying to support those kids. And that's all you can do because the other stuff, they don't care whether you're there or not. I think the more pointed question has been about a coaching change. I'll just I'll just give you everything. I know. Yeah. There's, I get a lot of texts. This is over. It's going to end. It's obvious. I think a lot of that's guided by wishful thinking. Um, th th there may be a little information. Now, the, the one thing that I do have is kind of interesting. Um, I do I do have a contact or two that, that with some contacts in the ages. Well, there was allegedly a little bit of stirring last week, and that one, that came to me, which is kind of interesting. I pressed in a little bit on that, and it, I, I could tell my, my source didn't want to be super specific, and I respect that. There were probably some confidences and in information that can't be relayed without breaking some of those confidences, but it may be pointing me in the right direction. That said that the people, and, and maybe there's been some kicking on the tires just in case. I, I don't know. I don't know what all that means, but I will tell you that the, the one, the folks that I trust the most and, and have given me the most accurate answers over the years think they're not going to make a change. Well, I, I, you know, and that's fine. You've got your information, but I, I can tell you this. If they don't make a change, the only seats they will sell for basketball will be the corporate seats. Yeah. There are a few individuals, but they won't sell any season tickets. Because, first of all, you're looking at a total rebuild now. Now, I understand basketball You can with the portal and NIL, you can rebuild really quick. You can do it in one year. Look at South Carolina last year. They won 10 games. And this year, they're one of the top teams in the country. So it can be done. But uh, is Vanderbilt willing to do that? Yeah. This question is from Kay Searcy. I will kind of shorten it to basically get to the heart of the question. Is there any hope that Vanderbilt will be able to add softball in the near distant future? I don't see that for a couple of reasons. Being landlocked the way we are. Mm -hmm. They've already taken some of the rec fields away or part of it uh, with the uh, enhancements. Uh, I, I don't think that I don't I don't think softball would be the next one. I think gymnastics might be the next one if there is one. They're at 17 now. I don't know that they have to grow anymore. I don't know the Title IX stuff that's left. Uh, I don't think you'll see that for near future anyway, another sport coming in. Yeah. Volleyball launches in 2026, five? Next year. Yeah, 25. Okay. Uh, same questioner, Kay Searcy, although I'm in Orlando, I'm still super excited about the upcoming changes to Hawkins Field. We have an approximate timeline on when construction might begin. I think it's after this coming baseball season, maybe? I thought I'm it was sure. after season. After what? I thought it was after next year. So it would be fall of 2025. Yeah, I don't think the stadium would be complete until the end of 26. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I, I, that's what I interpreted it. I'll, I'll find out. So a question about the projected baseball lineup. We answered that. Okay, Go Doors 94 is a new basketball facility expected to open for the 24-25 season. Looks like they have a long way to go. I've, I've always been told, and I've not circled back around since the summer, but I, I've always told that's supposed to be in place and finished before the start of this football season. So, yeah, the, that end will be. Yes, correct. The I don't know if there's. I don't know if anything inside the you know the 
the student because a lot of that's going to be luxury seating. If there's like a a nuance there between, well, that's going to be finished for the football part, but the basketball's not. But I got the impression that it's all going to be done, and and it should be by that time. Yeah, I think it will be. Yeah, I I, I do. I think it's done. Yeah. Okay. SR Kane, let's pretend we live in a world we're in the market for a new basketball coach. Our previous two coaches have been opposite ends of the spectrum in just about every sense. Most notably, a recruiter with weak team building skills versus a team builder with weak recruiting skills or want to. What does our next coach look like in an ideal world in terms of traits? You don't have to list names. Well, you know, to me, right now with the change, the way the way it's, it's totally different what you look for now because of NIL and transfer portal. Yeah, it's all going to depend on you know. We talked about this with football, Chris. Uh, if, for a while, the uh, the available money was around a couple million. I'm guessing. I've heard it's anywhere from now from ten to twelve million available for football. So that's important for basketball as well. If there's not two or three million left for bas- for men's basketball, then I'm not sure we'll ever compete at a high level again if they decide to uh, still try to bring it in with freshmen. You don't win with freshmen. If you notice the Kentucky-Tennessee game the other day, Kentucky's as talented physically as anybody. But because they're very young, Tennessee had, what, four graduates on the floor? They got guys that are 25 yeah. years old playing against 17- and 18-year-olds. So that's a huge difference. Um, so that's where we'll be. We'll continually be uh, young, forever young. Yeah. SR Kane wants to know about our plans for spring football coverage. I think they're going to start spring practice. I put it on the board. I think it's March the 19th. We'll be there for as many as we can. I I don't know how often that's going to be me because I've got my SEC stuff to do just about every morning, not to mention getting kids on the bus. I'm sure I'll be there for scrimmages and maybe an occasional practice. I think Billy and Joey are going to go and do most of our coverage. But I will tell you, every time the doors are open, we will make an effort to be there. Uh, and I, th- I think Billy's probably going to be doing most of that because Joey's got class and all that. I'll be stuff. there for images for sure. Yeah. We uh, One thing I, I did want to let everyone know, there's not been a decision made yet where they're going to have the spring game. You know, last year they had it on the practice field. The, yeah. I think the chance is going to be at Innsworth maybe this year. I think they're trying to work on that. So, uh We'll wait and see, but I I think that because they can't do it in the stadium this year. Yeah. Okay, the Admiral VU, thoughts on the Tennesseans' take on Vanderbilt basketball attendance decline through the years. Uh, There was an article linked. Looks like it's from 2022-23. I don't know if something's been updated. I couldn't access it. I'm to the point where I just – I don't know what more to add here. No, the only thing I'd say is I made a a point – a couple of years ago, actually, on here, that it wouldn't be a bad idea to make them, you know, they're always needing space at Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. 3L and 3L, just eliminate those, make those offices for whatever you need, whatever sport, and uh, bring capacity down to 9,500 to 10,000. Yeah. Man, I never would have thought we'd be having this conversation. Well, <clears throat> now, but besides performance, we we all know and we've we've all said it. This when Memorial, when Memorial Gym was packed, it was pre Titans, pre Predators. Yeah, that's part of it. It really is. I get it. And the and the fact that Nashville, there's so much to do, and it's uh, you know it's become a lot like Atlanta. Georgia Tech yeah. has a tr- trouble drawing. Yeah, and, and I like Georgia Tech in that manner. Admiral VU wants to know any breakdown or information you may have on the Tennessee NIL investigations, any guesses on whether sanctions could be levied? Uh, I'll hold my tongue on that. You go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's very preliminary. I'm here and they may be in in big trouble. We'll see how that turns out. Um, not, Not reporting, just based on a little info i can't really go a lot further than that we'll, we'll see i will say this let me let me interject that when i said i'd hold my tongue I, I don't understand the national press and uh and stuff like paul feinbaum and 
Now I know he's SEC flag, but whatever. Why it's oh poor Tennessee? Why are they picking on Tennessee? That type of stuff. I don't get that. I, you know, if you've done something wrong, admit to it, move on. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I have. I don't have any compassion for that. Vanderbilt's the only school in the SEC that's never been on probation. So that's one problem we haven't had. Knock on wood. Chi Town Door, question about Stackhouse job stability. We addressed that. Do you know of any donors' willingness to set up and fund and, and fund the Stackhouse buyout? I mean, I don't think that would be hard for them to raise with what they've got. I think yeah. it's eight to ten million. The question to me is just do they do they want to? I think that's probably a bigger question than money, but I could be wrong. Oh, anything else in here? Uh, here's a good one. T.C. Stevenson, why do I get the distinct feeling I'm not going to like whatever fixes the SEC and Pick 10 get together to propose? <laughs> because we're the person at the party. <clears throat> Excuse me. Vanderbilt is the person at the party that stands over in the corner and no one's talking to him. You're in the room with conversation, but your ideas and the, the way you view college athletics is totally different from the other 13 schools or now yeah. plus Texas and Oklahoma. So we just kind of have to go along with whatever everybody wants to do and then try to adjust on the fly. Yeah. Candace put out a press release on the NIL stuff and urging people to to kind of, and I from what I hear that that resonated pretty well with the booster base. I, I think it was kind of like, all right, Tennessee's going over here, so we're gonna go over there. Right. <laughs> and, that, and that tends to play pretty well with the, yeah. with the crowd. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, let's see. Here's one you'll know better than I do. You, uh, well, I mean, I, I have an idea. I have a pretty good idea. You will, you will give a better answer, I guess, is the way I want to phrase it. DFW Mark, did Clark Lee give total control of the offense and defense to his coordinators the first three years? Did he not challenge Lynch and Howell, or did he just let them run the offense and defense without his input? Uh, offensively, Yes. And it was a mistake. Defensively, no. Uh, but there was butting of heads, let's just say that. Yeah. And, you know, the boss will win in that, and that's why he's gone. I, I don't think the defensive room was a, a very pretty scene last year. I don't think the offense was either, but. No. Let's see. Some woe is me questions. I'll stay away from those. Um, yeah, I think I think most of the other things fall into this is the um, either who's getting fired or or this is misery category. <laughs> no, no sense in <laughs> going down those. Uh, okay, here's one. I'll just let you answer this. If you're Vanderbilt and the genie grants you three somewhat reasonable wishes, what do you wish for? Don't account for how Vanderbilt typically operates. Let's assume you can make anything happen here as long as it's reasonable. Uh, Lord, can I give some thought and answer it on the next podcast? Because there's so many things that I'd like to say, but narrowing it down to three would be difficult on a shut source notice. But I will answer that question next week. Yeah, I, I would go back to my answer about 2004 and try to try to find a way to reverse all that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I think let's just call it a day. Yeah, Ori. I heard Oreo. He said, "Call it a day." He's he's excited about something. <laughs> Parting thoughts. Well, uh, I'm excited about baseball cranking up. Of course. Uh, We've got to live through another 10 games of basketball. I'm interested to see, and I don't want to say the word quit, but I'm interested to see how we play at South Carolina, who is a very, very good defensive physical team Saturday. Uh, it looks like a kind of game that will be mucked up, and if it is, that's the kind of games that we struggle in uh, to match the physicality. Uh, I'll be interested to see how the kids respond. Uh, there's not a lot to play for anymore, and uh, it's uh, we still got another what three weeks of this basketball. 
Here's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah. In seven days, you and I will talk, and we will be two days from baseball. Yay, 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 yay. And on a happy note, Luke. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching the Vandy Sports Podcast and listening to it wherever you get it. Uh, if you don't mind, leave us a, a five-star rating if you like it and some nice comments. That, that helps us out, helps us get noticed. Thank you to our sponsors, Wash House, Anchor Impact, Sutherland and Belk, Maynard Nexon, and Murfreesboro Pure Milk Studios. Those guys help make this possible. For Luke White, I'm Chris Lee. You've been listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. <laughs>